Hello everyone, welcome. Um, thank you for joining me here at um, in our CGS uh, Lunch and Learn Instagram session. My name is Chen Yi Sum and I'm a lecturer of social sciences here at CGS. Um, I see that like some of you are joining me here. Thank you for coming and I look forward to talk more about uh, women, gender and health with you um, in this time that we have together. So let me just say a few things about myself first. Um, I am a cultural anthropologist by training. My research interests are kinship, family, gender, education and social inequality. And um, uh, since uh, uh, March is wrapping up. Uh, it's uh, every year in March. It's Women's History Month. I am really happy to have this opportunity to uh, to be here with you to talk a little bit about what we should be talking about when we talk about health among women and what what we can do uh, to do more to uh, to empower women and to close gen uh, close the gap of uh, gender disparity. So. Um, I am going to, um, so feel free to send in questions that you may have uh, uh, for me about my research, about my, my perspective about uh, gender and health, about things that I'm going to talk about. So um, I look forward to a lively interaction, uh, interactive sections here with you. And um, again, thank you for joining me and welcome everybody if you have just joined us. All right, so um, I guess I'm going to start with uh, two questions that I already received prior to this uh, prior to this session, and uh, in responding to two, these two questions, I think it would be possible for me to uh, to talk a little bit about my research um, in China as well. So the first question that I got from the audience is that what social factors affect women's health care uh, specifically? This is um, this is a very good question. That is, um, it's something that like I'm I'm very interested in. As a as a social cultural anthropologist, I strongly believe that if we look if we look at the issue of health, we can't just look at biology or we can't just look at um, um, medicine. Right? We can't just look at um, nutrition. There are a whole lot of uh, social factors that would affect how well a woman is doing, not only just physically, mentally, but also socially. I strongly believe that all these kind of different factors have to be taken into account when we talk about women's health. Um, here, I want to draw in a little bit um, uh, to talk about it in relation to my research among the Mosul people in China. So uh, one of my research projects is with with, uh, an ethnic minority group in southwest in China, and they are um, they are known as the Mosul people. It's a very small population. There are only forty thousand Mosul um, nowadays. Um, so I had the privilege to uh, to live with them for nine months as I conducted my research about about kinship and social inequality. And um, the Mosul. Mosul is a great community to work in. Um, some of you may have heard about this community before. It's a community known for being the women's kingdom in the sense that it's one of the uh, matrilineal cultures, matrilineal societies that we see in today's uh, 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 in today's world. Uh, what does it mean when I say matrilineal society? So among the Mosul, women generally have a pretty high status, especially when compared with, uh, with the neighboring Han Chinese people, with many other patriarchal society that, that we see around the world. Um, in Mosul legend, in, in Mosul mythology, uh, women are usually the goddesses. They have very high, high status. Um, women are the head of households in today's Mosul society. Um, uh, uh, property inheritance is passed along the matri line, passed uh, pass from mother to daughter rather than to, to sons as we may imagine it. Um, women has quite quite a lot of uh, autonomy. They practice this system called walking marriage, which means that after a man and woman get together, they don't officially get married or officially move in together as we may expect when a couple gets married, right? Instead, they practice this system called walking marriages, which means that every night, the man would go visit the woman fa woman's family uh, in the woman's village, right? And then, um, and then he'll probably spend the night there. And by daytime, he would walk back to his natal family to stay with his mother, to stay with his siblings. And his primary, his, 
a man's primary responsibility here is to take care of his sister's children because those are the those are the children those are the, the inheritors of the uh, of his household that he has uh, uh, he has responsi responsibility over so we have this like system that might be quite different from us leading to the uh, to the um, phenomenon that everybody is living with their with their mothers with their grandmothers with their natal household um, there is less domestic abuse because um, there is no chance for a, a, for, for a husband to to um, to really bully a woman when a woman is with his with her own family right so it's the society that like in a lot of respect we see women enjoying high status. And what we find in our research, we did survey, we did anthropometric exams on, on people, uh, we give them medical checkup. And what, what we found in this research is that within among matrilineal Mosul community, women generally fare better in terms of their, um, um, they're less likely to suffer from hypertension, they are less likely to suffer from risks that might lead, lead to uh, chronic diseases. For example, they, they show less severe chronic inflammation, which shows that like your body is constantly under stress and your, 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 your uh, immune system constantly flares up. Right? So um, in this, uh, what we found is that like in this society where women enjoy higher status, more autonomy, um, they, they would have less stress, they would, um, they are less worried about um, um, uh, domestic abuse, they, would, they have a stronger social network uh, because they stay, they stay in their, their own family, they stay in their native village with, without having to move to the husband's village to live in in-laws after they married, right? So we, we are running analysis, we are still working on this research, but some preliminary observation is already coming up that in this matrilineal community where women enjoys more autonomy, higher status, they have the rights to inherit, all these are good factors leading to, um, to a better health outcome among women. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is that social cultural factors matters. How women are treated in the society actually matters in affecting their physical uh, well-being. Um, so I look forward to talking more about this research with you, but in the meantime, let me just move on to the second question that I already got. Uh, how has COVID affected healthcare for women? So um, we are in this pandemic for a year already, and it really leads to uh, exacerbated uh, um, uh, crisis and inequality in our society, right? What this kind of crisis or pandemic or disasters are doing to our society, oftentimes it uh, it amplifies the kind of social inequality that we are already seeing, right? I mean, obviously, in this um, during this pandemic, a lot of people are affected um, many negatively, uh, mentally, physically, and 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 most likely economically as well. Right, um, and I mean, like even before COVID time, uh, women tends to um, face a lot of social inequality already. Right, they tend to have lower pay. They tend to have like less uh, benefit eligible, uh, um, uh, stable full time kind of emp employment. They tend to have heavier burden in childcare. They tend to. Um, um, there are all kinds of like social inequality that they they are. Uh, already subject to that, right? So what, what, uh, it goes back to something that like I'm really interested in addressing in my research, in the sense that to what extent does psychological stress actually um, affect physical health, well-being, right? In this pandemic, again, everybody is probably uh, affected somewhat, but um, for women who are already doing less well in terms of their socioeconomic uh, uh, condition, in terms of their social status, the pandemic could have like hit them particularly hard because it just makes life a lot more stressful. And um, I think, uh, I hope that, I mean, like with all these, uh, all these crises that we are facing in the society, we'll become more aware about like uh, the kind of inequality that we are seeing in different um, in in our in our society, and some marginalized or some underprivileged groups might be um, might be affected or hit particularly hard. Right. Let me look at another question that just pops up. 
what types of policies do you think the U.S. could implement to improve women's health care? Um, this is an excellent question. Um, in this Instagram session, I hope that like we are not just going to convey uh, a pessimistic kind of message that like, oh, inequality is a bad thing. It's so difficult to get away from inequality, right? Um, I hope that like uh, with our conversation, we can start thinking about what can we do to really improve women's health. Uh, women's health. One thing that I strongly believe in is that, again, um, women's health is not just a medical or biological matter. In order for us in our society, in the U.S. society, to, to, um, to really uh, help women, I think it's important for us to, to really take care of them socially as well. Is there, a way, um, is there a way for us as a society that we can think more consciously about how to uh, alleviate um, social economic stress that some women may be suffering? Uh, more so than, than men do, right? Um, is it possible for us to really um, to really tackle the issue of domestic violence that um, that uh, that again it's um, it's becoming a more more serious problem during the pandemic as well as more people are being stuck at home and um, there there are a news report coming up saying that like. Um, domestic violence is going up as well. And domestic violence, I mean, like even before the pandemic, women, um, a lot of women, they just like disproportionately suffer from more domestic violence than, uh, than men usually do, right? Um, is it possible for us to take care of these issues so that women can, lead, can, can have less stress, can have less pressure, and they can thrive more, um, more socially and, and, uh, and health-wise as well? So again, what I believe in is that like, um, in order to improve women's health, we do need to think about more holistic ways to address the uh, structural inequality that we already see in the society. It's not enough just to try to, oh, maybe let's provide more, uh, more access to nutritional food or more access to, um, to uh, medical services for women. I think it's an it's a important thing to do, but it's not the only thing that we should be doing or we should be thinking about in terms of thinking about uh, um, improving women's health. We need to think about a more holistic solution in order to, uh, to really achieve uh, women empowerment if they have higher status in, in, um, in the society, if uh, women's work is being appreciated more, um, overall it's good for, uh, for women's health. Um, another question is coming in. Let me just read it out. How are these disparities compared with race as, it, as a factor as well, right? Um, one thing about social inequality is that like um, um, all these kind of things are, are, are really interrelated, right? Uh, what we see with structural inequality is that um, there are a few, um, there are some populations that might be might be suffering from the pandemic or being adversely affected by the pandemic or unexpected circumstances more so than some other communities would, right? Um, obviously, in the in in the U.S., I mean, uh, we may think that like um, uh, people of a certain particular race, I mean like uh, black and brown people, they may suffer from structural inequality uh, more so than some other, some other uh, racial groups do. Um, what, uh, what I do believe is that um, it's very difficult to take this issue apart. Um, oppression is oppression. Um, uh, inequality is inequality. Um, I don't want to get into really like ranking like which groups are more disadvantaged, which groups might need more help, right? I think the, the way that I like to see the, uh, the issue is that um, all kinds of inequality is bad. And chances are if you see, um, um, it's impossible to just uh, address one aspect of inequality, right? For example, uh, if we are bringing, bringing race into the issue, right? Um, the, the pressure or the, uh, the struggle that our, our black women may face would be very different from the pressure and struggle that uh, our white women may face, right? So, um, I mean, like we are not just, um, I mean, uh, human conditions are, is a complex uh, issue and it's very difficult uh, to, to just um, uh, isolate one aspect of, uh, of, of our 
um, of our racial or gender characteristics uh, when talking about how to uh, how to provide for uh, better empowerment for um, for marginalized or disadvantaged groups, right? So um, I'm hoping that like uh, my research on gender and the suggestions about um, improving, having a more holistic understanding about uh, social support, providing social support, um, protecting people from um, from being physically or mentally harmed in an unfair way, um, to uh, to really advocate for people who who may be less privileged in this society. Um, I hope that even though like this talk is specifically about women women's status and women's health. I hope that like uh, some of these initiatives that we are going to talk about here actually have ramification as to our uh, thinking about how we can work together to eliminate or to, uh, to, to basically make better the situation of structural inequality that we see in our society. Um, yeah, I see that like some people, uh, more and more people are joining us. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one thing that I, I also want to talk about is that um, in terms of health, it's, uh, uh, women's health is, a, is quite an interesting issue um, because um, among scientists, we have long been interested in this paradox that we call uh, the survival health paradox. Uh, what I mean by that is that we see a, around the world, we see women usually um, having longer lifespan. Longevity among women is usually uh, it, it's it's usually better among uh, among men, but at the same time, women are usually prone to more chronic diseases than men do. So sometimes when when scientists look at this um, so called health survival paradox, um, again uh, we tend to look into biological factors that may that may that may give rise to this paradox, right? Um, are women not having a sm um, not eating enough? Um, is it because of feminine hormone that it produces some sort of effects in your body that makes you more prone to chronic disease? Or looking at the fact that women, women bear children, uh, reproduction and, um, and childbearing added another layer of health risk to women's health, right? So there are different issues that, uh, that we have been looking at. Um, we, as a scientific community, have to be looked uh, have been looking at in terms of trying to understand why women tends to tends not to do as well as men do in some indicators in some risk factors for chronic disease right but what has been uh, recently getting a lot of traction getting a lot of attention is also um, the social cultural aspects that I'm talking about Right, maybe uh, what women need is not just better nutrition or better access to medical facility, better medical services, right? But they need to be able to thrive in a, in a, an environment that that uh, that that is less stressful. That may tell them that like um, uh, they they are inferior to other populations in the society. Another thing that may affect the um, this health survival uh, paradox or this phenomenon that. Uh, we still see this persistent uh, health disparity. It's also about physician treatment of, of women's diseases as well, right? Uh, some of you may have heard about it already, but I mean, there are a lot of research coming out that like um, um, diagnosis about, um, about certain conditions, for example, depression, for example, chronic pain, all these di diagnoses when physician was making, were making, uh, make, making a diagnosis, they um, maybe consciously or subconsciously treat women differently than they would when treating men, right? Uh, for example, if a woman goes to um, goes to a doctor to try to uh, tr try to ask about her chronic back pain, right? Um, a physician is more likely to treat women women's complaining as, oh, you're just whining. Uh, is psychological. Mentally, you think you're hurting, but you are actually not. 
is something that like we need to fix your mind with. No, we, we don't need to give you as much opioid or we don't need to give you as much as medicine to really alleviate your condition because what you're talking about is physical, uh, is, is mental, it's not physical, right? Versus a man, when, when a man show up at a physician office complaining about back pain and what's what's going on is that like a physician may, may, may just subconsciously think that like, oh, a man usually have high, uh, I mean like have high pain tolerance, they usually want to look tough. If they really come into my office and complain about back pain, something must be going really wrong, right? So we already have uh, have, have research studies coming up showing that physicians, when, when treating some conditions, um, when treating some symptoms, they may not treat people of different gender and of course people of different races um, um, in in the same way, right? So this is something that like we also need to tackle, right? In terms of like um, um, physicians, in terms of uh, doctors trying to provide a more equi uh, uh, equitable uh, healthcare for everybody, is there some subconscious biases that we, we should also talk about uh, when thinking about um, how to provide better healthcare, right? Again, gender, race, class, all these are relevant factors for us to think about when we think about how to provide more um, more applicable services for, for people. Another thing that I want to point out that is that in, in terms of scientific research, um, we also see the phenomenon that um, some women uh, may show biologically, maybe they show different symptoms for particular disease or, or particular sickness, that the symptoms are different from, from what men would be showing, right? But the issue is, the problem is that um, a lot of scientific research, medical research, whether we are talking about research done among mice uh, or animals or research done about uh, 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 among people, right? Uh, there tends to be a gender bias as to whom we are using as research participants, whom we are recruiting as research subjects, right? Um, usually, for example, let's talk about mice, right? A lot of medical exam, uh, medical research use mice as uh, as their um, uh, as their subject of of, of exp examination, and obviously, when they got some mice into the laboratory, um, there are male mice, there are female mice, right? But usually, the male mice are, are used for the actual study. They are the proper subject here. The female mice, rather, they're using them for reproduction, right? Producing new research subject for you to conduct um, conduct this, this kind of experiment. So what we see is that um, a lot of medical research, if they're using mice, um, usually we are talking about um, the mice sample that they are using usually are at least 70% or 80% mice, right? Versus like the female mice they are used for like just giving birth to new mice so that we can continue with the research, right? Um, I think this is something to be addressed because this also, I mean like this taps into some biases or misconceptions that we have about, about how valid scientific researches are, right? If women or if female subjects are being, uh, disqualified or being ignored in this kind of study, I mean, usually people give two reasons, right? First reason is that we don't need to study female because male and female, they are so biologically alike that maybe just putting female aside, focusing on male subjects, that would already give us valid enough result to, to be applicable to everybody, right? So that's sort of like the first reasons that people are sometimes using in order to justify why we tend to use more male mice than female mice in laboratory study, right? The second pretty contradictory reasons or excuse that people tend to use is that female mice are so different they produce different hormones, they, they have like different biological processes. If we include female mice in our study, it's going to compromise our, our research results because there are some things that are fundamentally not comparable, right? What I want to point out is that you can't have both of these, these rationale um, uh, happening at once, right? On the one hand, you're saying that men and women are so, male and female are so alike that there is no reason for us to do, do separate experiment. On the other hand, we are, we are saying that like, no, they're just like two different. And for this experiment, I just pre prefer to use male mice so that like we can have, uh, have a valid enough result, right? Why don't we talk more about like, okay, if male and female mice are so different, why can't we do more study on, on, on female mice, right? Is it going to tell us something different, right? Rather than just 
kind of like a, a participant, maybe it's worth it's worth thinking about how we can uh, how we can advance our scientific uh, understanding, scientific knowledge, also by taking gender into account in conducting our biomedical research as well. So. Um, yeah, let me just make sure I seem to have um, addressed all the questions already. Um, but again, thank you all for joining me. If um, if there are no further questions, I guess I will, um, I mean, uh, I think we had a pretty good conversation. And if you would like to get in touch and, and to talk more about gender, talk more about uh, more so in China, talk more about health, um, please feel free to contact me via email. Um, I'd love to talk to you and thank you again for, uh, for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to share some of my findings and some of my uh, perspectives with you. I hope that all of you have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.